Well, welcome. Uh, the Center for Arab and Islamic Studies at the ANU is very pleased to have as a visiting professor, uh, Professor Amr Hamzawi, who is here for a few weeks and uh, is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and is one of the world's great experts on Arab politics and especially on Egypt. So we're delighted. Welcome, uh, Thank Professor you very much. Hamzawi. Thank you very um, much. Obviously, the events of Egypt are of great concern to many people across the world, and you have been living it as well as studying it. Yeah. And I wonder if you could tell us about how you see the state of the of political development in Egypt today. Many of us, of course, are concerned about the uh, what appears to be uh, an increasing authoritarianism. Right. So I'd be interested in hearing your view it, on that. Right. I and mean, it's 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 a new breed of authoritarianism which is uh, emerging. Has been emerging since the military coup in July 2013. It's um, uh, more aggressive when it comes to human rights abuses and violations as compared to Egypt uh, prior to the revolution of 2011. So um, uh, in the three decades long uh, era of uh, former President Mubarak, human rights abuses and violations were not uh, in, in, in such a disastrous situation as they are now. Uh, in fact, uh, Egyptians are waking up every day to hear about cases of forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, torture in prison, and most of these cases were not as common uh, since the 1980s and all the way to 2011. Secondly, it's, it's a new breed of authoritarianism because it has been using extensively lawmaking as mm -hmm. a way to uh, entrench itself uh, into the state apparatus as well as into uh, the management of a social fabric. So just to give you a round figure, between the coup in July 2013 and today, close to 400 laws were passed by the current government, most of which undermine safeguards for personal liberties and freedoms. Well, th that's very interesting. One of the laws that has g gained a, sort of a lot of attention in the West is the, the, the NGO laws, right. the non-governmental laws. And I know that in the past, um, the law was pretty draconian, exactly. uh, but appears to be now even more so. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Sure, you're very right. I mean, new legislation, it's yet to be enacted law. Uh, pending the president's uh, signature. So the new legislation which passed uh, parliament in, in fact, two days, which is remarkable for any legislation yes. to pass parliament in two days. Yes. And it's a long piece of legislation, w w uh, close to 100 articles. Um, passing parliament in two days uh, is a signal that this was approved by the government and was pushed to parliament to pass it uh, quickly. When you look at the details, it's more draconian as uh, compared to the uh, still existing law of 2002. It imposes more um, uh, punishments on uh, civil society organizations and civil society activists and it creates a new environment, quasi-legal environment in which surveillance uh, becomes a key tool of the government to manage uh, civil society. So you can no longer get funds um, uh, internally or externally without the approval of not simply the Ministry of Social Affairs as it used the case. In fact, the legislation creates an intelligence-driven uh, government giant, a new body, uh, which is called the agency to monitor NGOs and you have to get permission from that agency to get donations domestically or get funds from outside of the country. It subjects you to uh, additional layers of financial uh, uh, oversight. It subjects NGOs to um, licensing issues which b basically make it impossible for NGOs to operate uh, freely. So yes, I mean, this is one of the key legislations which uh, were passed in the last three and a half years. Along with it are leg legislations on terrorism, on uh, demonstration, uh, demonstration law, uh, different, leg different amendments to the penal code, all, all of which uh, seriously eat safeguards for personal rights and freedoms. So what I, what I take from what you're saying is that uh, you believe that civil society really has deteriorated um, even more so than it had been under Mubarak. Yes. And I think you've, you're on record as saying that it's the situation is worse than since the 1950s. Right, right. And you believe that that... Uh, yes, I mean, it's, it's quite... In fact, mm, there are different similarities between the current situation and uh, the period um, uh, w between 1952 and 1956 
um, uh, we have been uh, looking at uh, a huge number of laws, as I was uh, just saying, passed with the one objective of uh, closing off the public space, uh, in fact, um, uh, pushing and imposing on civil society a war of extinction. This is no longer a siege which is imposed on civil society organizations, mm -hmm. it's a war of extinction. And as a result, most independent organizations, in fact, left the country. They are operating right now increasingly out of Tunisia, Egyptian organizations operating out of Tunisia or out of different European uh, destinations. Um, uh, similar to the 1952-1956 uh, period, it is the military and the security services which are directly in charge. This is no longer a president ruling with a ruling party or uh, putting himself and his ruling establishment behind the facade of uh, semi-pluralist dynamics or limited pluralism. This is a military establishment and security apparatus ruling and interfering everywhere. The parliamentary elections 2015 were managed directly by the security services, intelligence uh, services. Uh, parliament is uh, in a submissive uh, moment unseen before. They recently expelled an MP, a serving MP, who was uh, uh, occasionally critical of the government and at, at literally no opposition, only eight MPs out of over 500 opposed it or abstained. So this is um, um, a phase in which a new ruling establishment is entrenching itself using the executive um, uh, branch of government but dominating the legislative and the judicial branch of government as well. This is your idea about indirect uh, exactly. repression. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's not, it's, not that it, 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 it's not that they are only depending on human rights abuses and violations. Uh, they do have a web of tools, primary judicial legal tools, tools which have been uh, put in place to create an indirect uh, repressive environment. I'm, I'm interested in the external connections sure. here because it seems that on the one hand um, assistance, financial assistance from America or the European Union or whatever uh, can be supportive of civil society. I know that, that bothers the state in some way but on the other hand uh, America in particular has a very strong military relationship right. and the great amount of money of course that goes for the support of the military. Mm -hmm. So in your view, do the external relations with, say, the European powers or America in particular, do they help or do they hinder um, the development of, say, a, a pluralistic order or do they support authoritarianism? Well, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that I have to say that in, 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 in looking at uh, uh, Egypt's uh, developments between 2013 and today, it's unfortunate that the European and American um, uh, tools, uh, different um, uh, tools related to economic cooperation, diplomatic cooperation, but military cooperation as well, that these tools uh, have not been used in any significant manner to uh, not only not to push for a pluralist uh, arrangement, uh, pluralist state society relations, but even to hinder uh, the government's, the current mm -hmm. government's appetite for human rights abuses and violations. Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't been used in any significant manner. In a way, um, uh, Egypt moving away from the brief democratic opening of 2011 to 2013 into a new authoritarian uh, government seemed to have been fine with most European uh, governments and with the previous as well as with the current American Absolutely. administration. But moving beyond the West, it's important to look at um, uh, Middle Eastern actors too. Yes, I would so ask I you that. Yes, because I mean, you cannot, mm. um, uh, any observer uh, of Egypt uh, cannot understand the shifts which have been happening in the last years unless uh, the role of Saudi Arabia, the role of the United Arab Emirates, of key Middle Eastern countries um, uh, is factored in. Saudi Arabia and the UAE um, uh, were instrumental in backing the military and in pushing for um, uh, the military coup. Well, why is that? Is it because it's an anti-Muslim brotherhood? That to that an extent, true? yes. I mean, they, uh, especially Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are, um, uh, their officials are on the record um, uh, pushing against the Muslim Brothers and for, for different reasons, which are domestic uh, primarily. Um, uh, in a way, uh, pushing against a movement which seems to be creating um, uh, tensions in, in the respective uh, um, uh, country away from Egypt was confused with pushing against the Muslim Brothers in Egypt. And of course, 
benefiting from uh, a stream of mistakes which the Brotherhood committed between 2011 and the coup in 2013. Um, secondly, it's simply because democracy is not um, uh, a favored um, uh, governance model yes. uh, from a Saudi or a UAE uh, perspective. And in, in, in a way, there was always a conscious attempt since the Arab uprisings in 2010 and 2011 to undermine the democratic potential of these uprisings. It, it mm -hmm. happened in Egypt. It, in fact, w was attempted in Tunisia in the last parliamentary elections. When you look um, at the details in Yemen, in Bahrain, which was crushed, a democratic uprising mm -hmm. crushed by direct uh, direct military uh -huh. uh, march of the Saudis. So in, in a way, it fits into their own uh, vision. Uh, this is not a region where, where they would like democracy emerging, where they would like democratic, accountable govern, governments emerging, and, 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 and that shaped their uh, behavior vis-a-vis -vis Egyptian development since 2011. Oh, well, thank you very much. Professor, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but we wish you all the best in your time in Australia thank and you with very your much. work.